Welcome to this uh, webinar from the OECD. Uh, this webinar uh, is going to be on particle size and size distribution. Is the death guide 125? So before we start, what we want to make sure is that you have uh, the right functions and the right setting in front of you. So you will see that uh, today we will have uh, the um, the webinar is going to be given in English, but we will have a simultaneous translation into Spanish. So you have to see uh, the interpretation button at the bottom of your screen. So you have it in, in red uh, on the screen. If you do not have uh, this little button, you need to um, start all over your access to Zoom and use uh, the link that is in, in the screen. Uh, so please choose the appropriate language that uh, you would like uh, to have for this uh, webinar. We can go to the next slide. So a couple of um, of um, recommendations for this uh, webinar, please, if you have questions throughout the, the webinar, use the Q&A function, which is also at the bottom of your, of your uh, in, in the bottom ribbon of your screen. Uh, do not use the chat. The chat will be used uh, exclusively to send you links that are associated to the slides that you're seeing, but also you can use the chat if you're having some uh, technical difficulties. Uh, we will have, uh, the webinar is going to be recorded, so both uh, English and Spanish, and the slides and the webinar will be made available uh, on the OECD public site afterwards. So as you have registered for this uh, webinar, you will be receiving a notification in your inbox uh, once uh, once that is uh, is available, if you need any assistance uh, during the webinar, you can send us a message via the chat, or you have the emails from Hannah Tabet, my colleague, or myself, Mar Gonzalez, and we will be able uh, to to help you there. Okay. So I think we can go to the next slide, and uh, perhaps uh, one. Uh, to present you uh, the speakers that we will have with us today. So we are very lucky because the test guideline 125 was uh, drafted, was uh, led, and was uh, completed by our speakers today. So you will have first-hand information. So we will have uh, today with us uh, Dr. Katrin Schoen, which is a scientific staff officer at uh, the German Environmental Agency since 2009. At UBA, her work focuses on environmental risk assessment and regulation of nanomaterials. So her main emphasis uh, or her current work is really on amendments of OECD test guidelines and guidance documents to the specificities of nanomaterials and also to um, ensure that the needs uh, of current legislations are properly addressed. And she is also sharing at OECD uh, the steering group on advanced materials. Then we will have with us Dr. Thomas Kulbusch from the German Federal Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, Bauer. Uh, Thomas is an aerosol and nanomaterial researcher. He has been coordinating the EU project NanoHarmony and is also co-chairing uh, the Malta Initiative, both working on improving and developing OECD test methods and nano and advanced material for regulatory use. And he has uh, quite an impressive work uh, uh, from the research uh, point of view, but also from the regulatory point of view in working with the OECD for several years now. We will have, we will hear also from Harald Bresch, who uh, is an environmental physicist by teaching, and he got his PhD with the characterization of aerosols by synchrotron radiation. Harald has been working at BAM since 2007 on the characterization of aerosols and since 2010 with the focus on nanomaterials. Last but not least, we will have with us Dr. Doris Volker, who's also a scientific staff at the German Environmental Agency, where she works on ecotoxicology related issues since 2009. Her focus is mainly on the environmental risk assessment of nanomaterials and the needs for adaptation of methods and instruments to provide reliable data to comply with regulation, uh, regulatory information requirements. 
So my four speakers today have been involved in the OECD Working Party on Manufacturing Nanomaterials for several years, more than 15. Uh, so they will have uh, they have the perfect background to combine uh, the scientific knowledge and and to bring that to a regulatory perspective. So with uh, with no further ado, we're going to start this webinar. I'm just going to give you a very quick introduction uh, on the OECD test guidance. There have been other webinars online and you can access them and we will share with you all the links so you can access this information later on. But I would like to remind you that at the OECD, we're really aiming to develop quality standards for the safe assessment of chemicals. So the OECD test guidelines for the testing of chemicals are a collection of internationally agreed testing methods used by governments, industry, and independent laboratories to assess the safety of chemicals. But what we have behind is that we have a system called the mutual acceptance of data, which means that if you test once, the data is accepted everywhere. So we have very reliable, reproducible uh, test methods. And to support those guidelines, we also develop uh, guidelines, uh, guideline studies, or we develop guidance documents. And these guidance documents provide a detailed explanation on selected aspects of testing. They provide uh, more flexibility to adapt guidance to specific tests or test chemicals. So depending on the situation, you could have a, a guidance document that is developed so you know how to use an existing test guidelines for nanomaterials, for example, or you can have a test guidelines that has an associated guidance documents providing more information uh, on how to, to use this test guide. So if we go to the next slide. So on the test guidelines program, we have different sections. We have test guidelines on physical properties, which is uh, the section that we're going to be addressing, for example, today with the test guideline on particle size and size distribution. We have a section addressing a biotic system, environmental fate and behavior, health effects, and some other test guidelines, for example, uh, related to pesticides. So for the first uh, four sections of uh, test guidelines, we have been working to develop uh, the specific, the specific uh, methods for nanomaterials. And uh, just to remind us, so the OECD is uh, primarily used on regulatory safety testing and subsequent chemical notification and registration. So the set of test guidelines is updated on, regular on a regular basis to keep pace with progress in science, but also to, response, uh, to respond to the country's regulatory needs. So we have an OECD-wide network of national coordinators and national experts like those that will be providing uh, the talks today that provide input from scientists in governments, academia, and industry. So if you visit our page Nanomet, you will find all the test guidelines and guidance documents for nanomaterials that are available to date and the links to access the rest of documents developed by the OECD. So all that is uh, free of charge, so you can just uh, go there and download them. And with no further ado, I think I'm just going to give uh, the floor to our experts. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, and I think we will start with uh, Dr. Shrin. Uh, Catherine, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mar, for the nice introduction and good day to everybody, also from my side and on behalf of my colleagues, which are here today with us. Um, I want to give you just a uh, first uh, small background information how it comes to this uh, test guideline. So the motivation behind uh, our task was uh, to come up with standardized and harmonized methods that helps to identify if a material is a nanomaterial, for instance, could help um, to find out if a material falls under a specific definition of nanomaterials, like the definition of ISO or the recommendation of the U European Union. And with this to also figure out if a material is subject for existing nanospecific requirements. Another part is also to help to characterize nanomaterials. So for instance, particle size or size distribution 
could be understand as a parameter to help to clear it, to clear describe um, a nanomaterial and with this uh, help to possibly match safety data to a corresponding nanomaterial or to compare safety data, data of different nanomaterials or to provide basis for grouping and read across. So uh, the need of uh, these parameters is, for instance, uh, explained in various regulatory guidance. So on EU level, it's, for instance, the ECHA guidance is on uh, registration and substance identification or the guidance on uh, grouping of nanomaterials. Next slide, please. Um, just to um, inform you, the TG125 is not the first test guide on, on particle size measurements. There's also an older one, the OECD test guideline 110 on particle size distribution and fiber lengths and diameter distribution, which was published in 1981, which is quite a time ago. And this test guideline is valid for particles with a diameter bigger than two micrometers and with uh, for fibers with a diameter bigger than 0.2 micrometer. And uh, when you look into this test guideline, you may notice that some of the standards are meanwhile outdated. And also because the validity range is quite high, it's obvious that this test guideline is inappropriate for the nanomaterials. And we had, before we started with uh, developing a new test guideline, we had an expert discussion whether we should update TG110 or develop new uh, test guideline. And um, yeah, the decision was uh, from this expert discussion and having in mind that there's the urgent need on a, a proper test guideline for nanomaterial to develop a first, uh, a new test guideline instead of updating the 110. Next slide, please. Um, how this uh, test guideline was realized. So in Germany, we started a research project which was funded by the Federal Ministry of Environment um, to develop this test guideline and the technical and scientific realization, realization was done by the Federal Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, Bauer, and the Federal Institute for Material Research and Testing where uh, the German Environment Agency was the contracting agency. We started this project in 2017, and this project feed into the WNT project 1.5 on a test guideline development, um, which was taken up in the work plan uh, 2018. So the duration of this project was 2070 to 2020, but with all these OECD um, process, it took until 2021 um, that uh, the test guideline was fit for approval. And the approval of this test guideline was in June 2022. And if you want to know more about uh, this project, which is behind the development of the test guideline, you can find the scientific report on the uh, internet side of uh, the German Environment Agency. So next slide, please. Um, the presentation of the uh, technical uh, part of this test guideline will be done today by Thomas Kubusch of Bauer and Harald Bresch of BAM. But there are a number of persons behind the development uh, for which I will take the opportunity today to say thank you. The first of all, it's obviously the German Federal Ministry for Environment, uh, because without their financial support, this test guideline would not have been realized. And from the um, technical and scientific uh, development of this test guideline, there are a number of people involved from the BAM and the Bauer. And here you can see from BAM, there's a lot of people from different um, sections involved because the BAM was um, responsible for the fiber part, which is the bigger part of this test guideline. And therefore, a lot of people are involved here. I don't read it out, all the names, but you can read it. And of course, a big thanks to the OECD secretariat, which gives a big support in 
uh, organizing meetings and uh, provide facilities for the expert meetings with the uh, yeah, various experts uh, from the OECD countries. But there we have also want to say a special thanks to all the participating institutes and laboratories that help to validate the methods. And you can see here over 30 um, institutes and laboratories which were involved in the validations around the world and they um, provide their input with um, yeah by their own funding and yeah it was a big support uh, to uh, finalize uh, this test guideline and before I now hand over to Thomas I just want to give you a short snapshot where you can find the test guideline next slide please um, there is an um, OECD website on the test guideline for chemicals, more already um, announced this. And there you have uh, sub sites for the various sections and the test guideline 125 you can find on this uh, side of section one. And at the moment, this TG is the very first um, test guideline on the list of all these test guidelines for physical chemical characterization. And yeah, you can then have a look on it afterwards. So with this, I hand over to Thomas. Yes, next slide. And uh, thanks a lot and welcome everybody to uh, this section. And I will start with an overview of what you can expect for today. And next slide, please. And what you can expect is, first of all, that we give a short introduction to the structure of the test guideline 125 uh, by the OECD. Um, then I will go a little bit into detail on the scope, significance, and use of this test guideline. Then there will be a large section particle measurements. And uh, Dr. Schwien already mentioned that this was a part by BAM. And there were quite a few methods uh, being investigated, and this will be presented by Harald Bresch. Then I will come back to you and we'll talk about the fiber measurements. And in the end, you will, uh, and we will have a period for questions and answers as already introduced by Mar Gonzalez. So next slide, please. If, and going into the structure of the test guideline, certainly everything starts somehow with an introduction. And then we have a section which is called definition. And just uh, a brief introduction to the definition is, this is a definition which is used for this test guideline. There was quite some discussion on definitions and there are different definitions by ISO, by different member countries uh, of the OECD, by different uh, communities. So here the part definition uh, in the test guideline refers to the terminology used in this test guideline. Scope, significant, and use will be introduced in some more uh, detail a little bit later. Initial considerations and limitation aspects of sample preparation, description of methods, and recommended materials for the validation of the tests will also be tackled during the uh, different sections of the presentation. And uh, then we have the test report, which uh, summarizes uh, how a test shall be reported, references, and the appendix. Next slide, please. The annex or appendix is something which is often overlooked or not seen as very important. We do see it differently. We go very much into detail on our understanding of definitions, which means how do we define particles, agglomerates, aggregates, and how do we use different terms within the test guideline? So this section going uh, quite significantly into some of the details may not be overlooked. Um, documents, how the standards uh, are available and used in this test guidelines are given in the part B of the annex. Um, one specific point I would like to mention is the part C. There you see a method for particle measurement technology uh, for single particle, which is the single particle inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry, SBICPMS. Um, this was part of the whole validation procedure. We uh, were ongoingly investigating, uh, looking into the results of what we obtained during the interlaboratory comparisons of developing TG125. We found the results not to be too good. 
Hence, we decided that the uh, SPICPMS will not be part of the main uh, section of this test guideline, but will be in the annex as an informative part. Part D, details of the uncertainty determination with the bootstrap method and fiber part related supplemental information. As the title already indicates, it gives us quite some background on uh, the uncertainty part of fiber detection, which will be also partially introduced uh, in the separate section. Part E is an interesting part. As uh, already said in the beginning, um, we always need to validate, evaluate our methods, how good they are in real place when we are in the lab. And we have within the validation report a list, or we have used within the validation procedure, a list of materials. So we included here within the test guideline, a list of test materials, which were used in the validation process so that all the users can actually try to have the same material or similar material then used by themselves to see how well and how comparable they are compared to the methods what was obtained during the validation procedures. Last but not least, the list of abbreviation, hopefully making the text a little bit more understandable to everybody because abbreviations are always different. And here you can have a look what is meant within this test guideline 125. Next slide, please. Scope, significant and use. And here I have to move my picture because I can't read the original text currently. Uh, presentation, certainly the uh, scope uh, of this test guideline is the presentation of methods to determine the size and size distribution of the nanoscale particles and fibers. Um, within this scope, we clearly say that it, the measurement methods we introduce are replicable for fire particles and fibers in the form of powders or in the dispersion in gas or liquids. The size range of the particles and fiber diameter we uh, say can be detected is from one nanometer to 1000 nanometer. While for fibers, the length is certainly longer and there we uh, define the range of measurements from one nanometer to 20 micrometer. Fibers are defined according to uh, this test guideline by the aspect ratio length divided by diameters to be larger or equal to the, uh, to the value of three. The test guideline is validated for the measurements of particle size and particle size distribution of individual particles, agglomerates, and aggregates. And that will be uh, dealt with also by Harald Bresch in the next presentation. It is, uh, on the other hand, also clear that not all the different measurement methods can make a or can distinguish between individual particles, agglomerates, and aggregates. And hence, this validation was done for all three. Next slide, please. The applied methods partially deliver data determined by equivalent behavior, I have written here. And with equivalent behavior, I mean that it, the uh, diameters reporters are equivalent diameters. The methods determine the behavior, which is the settling this or velocity, or which is the uh, speed of movement uh, by uh, in, in, in liquids. So uh, where we have uh, another diameter or the electro mobility diameter. So um, there are different methods using different methods for different uh, for determining the particle size and they result in equivalent diameters and these equivalent diameters can be different depending on how they are de uh, determined and may not be easily converted in another form of diameter that has to be known beforehand. Um, dispersions of particles in gases or liquids must be physically and chemically stable, stable over time, certainly over the time period while the measurement is ongoing. And with chemically stable, we also mean the, ter uh, the term or the part which is meant with solubility. If a chemical is soluble in uh, the dispersion media, so in the liquid, then certainly if it's dissoluted, um, it cannot be determined as a particle anymore. Hence, certainly we have to, uh, this ca uh, methods can only be used for dispersions which are physically and chemically stable. Another important part for the use 
is that sample preparation and dispersion preparation procedures are not part of this test guideline. The reason is the procedures depend very much on the purpose of measurements, which can be quite diverse. It can be that the behavior in aquatic environments has to be uh, analyzed. It can be that inhalation studies have to be done. And uh, for inhalation studies, a particle size distribution has to be measured as it is applied to the uh, different tests in vitro or in vivo test. So here we certainly describe the protocols and sample preparation within the validation procedures um, and in the validation report, but the sample preparation and dispersion preparation is not part of this test guideline 125. Next slide, please. With these introductory or overview remarks to the test guideline 125, I happily pass on to Harald Bresch of BAM, who will give you and present you all the details on the particles, the measurement methods and results. Harald, the platform is yours. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, and thank you for this nice overview. Uh, you already mentioned a lot of uh, points uh, where I can, which I can skip now. <laughs> and uh, this is a good thing. OK, next slide, please. Um, I want to start with an introduction and uh, some initial considerations about uh, the particles part. And uh, then I uh, go over to the uh, and uh, tell something about the methods included in the OECD TJ 125. And uh, finally, I tell something about the interlaboratory comparison and some final remarks. Next slide. First of all, we need to start uh, with the remarks that we have included seven uh, or, uh, or eight uh, methods in, in this test guideline for the particle uh, size distribution detection. Um, and most of this is choosing the right method out of these methods. Because the measurement of particles depends on the measurement range of the instrument, uh, the signal noise ratio, ratio on the, of the instrument, you can have radiation damage. And uh, of course, uh, the method needs to fit the material properties and sample preparation needs to be done uh, in accordance to the measurement and the material. Uh, solubility has to be regarded. Uh, the matrix material plays a role. But of course, software limits are also a, a, a subject. And um, for some methods, we even you need reference materials, which might not be available. In general, it is not possible to get a reliable res result with uh, only one method. And good scientific, uh, scientific practice therefore require to choose at least two complementary methods. And these methods need to fit for the specified purpose for the measurement. And uh, the message, message should deliver the right type of quantity for the specified purpose. Next slide, please. Um, type of quantity needs, needs uh, some explanation here. Um, if you have a particle size distribution, you have at the x axis, you have the diameter. And at the y axis, you have uh, normally a quantity. And the quantity might be expressed uh, in, as particle number or as area of a projection, or surface area, volume, mass, or intensity of scattered, scattered light. But depending on this uh, type of quantity, uh, you see in the right picture, you see uh, a particle size distribution with three maxima. Depending on the, uh, on the type of quantity, um, one, of this maxima will raise. In the upper one, you see uh, this is uh, the particle size, the, the type of quantity for the number, particle number. Um, and uh, in the lower picture, you see the type of quantity is volume. And uh, you have a totally different particle size distribution on the same data. <clears throat> so this means the mean, medan, and modal diameters will differ significantly. Um, luckily, ISO uh, already defined uh, an index system uh, uh, to address this. And uh, if you add an index uh, of zero to the diameter, then you have uh, then is, this is defined as number. If you add an index of two, this is defined as area. For volume, you have a three as index, and for intensity, you have an i as index. Um, recalculation is not a good idea and uh, will, in most cases, not be reliable here. Next slide, please. Um, here you see uh, already um, the 
proposed diameters within this uh, test guideline, the type of in, in the third column you see is a type of index is added to the diameter symbol, uh, but there is a second index added. And the second index refers to the measurement principle. So the measurement in the first line, you see atomic force microscopy and the measurement principle for atomic force microscopy is the height. This means you measure the height, you normally don't measure the length, not the width of the particle, you only measure the height. So the equivalent circular diameter um, is based only on the height of the particle. This is the measurement principle of the atomic force microscopy. But for every other method you have here listed, you have another measurement principle and thus another, uh, another uh, index here. And uh, so, so with this index system, you can now differentiate uh, which method was used to, to get a uh, diameter, a specific diameter. Next slide, please. <clears throat> What can you measure for a nearly spherical particle? This is an important thing. Um, you see here two solid particles. Uh, one is spherical, one is nearly spherical. It's actually, it's a cubic one, uh, but nevertheless, it's, it's called nearly spherical. But you might have um, additional an additional layer here, um, some uh, shell layer or some stabilization layer on top of this particle. And you might even have another layer <clears throat> the so-called fun functionalization layer, um, which adds some functionality to the particle. And on, as last, you can have, uh, you will have a solvation double layer on top of this, which measures some mes methods, uh, which are measuring uh, liquids. So, um, um, yeah, the measurement, um, each measurement method delivers one of these uh, diameters, or several of them. Uh, we will see this for electron microscopy, for example. Next slide. We have uh, also, Thomas said, sample preparation is not part of the TG, uh, and indeed it is not. Um, we have to, cons uh, have to uh, think a little bit about sample preparation. Sample preparation is critical for the outcome of the measurement, and therefore it needs a detailed reporting of all preparation steps for each material. And um, the concentration and stability of the sample needs always to fulfill the requirements of the chosen measurement method. Um, besides of the concentration and agglomeration and things like this, this may also include a stability in vacuum or radiation damage and uh, against deformation. Particles with a size bigger than one micrometer are not in the scope of this test guideline and therefore can either be removed or excluded during the elevation of the evaluation of the results. Depending on the purpose of the, uh, of the, sum, of the method uh, of the evaluation uh, of, the, uh, of the characterization of, of the particle size distribution, um, specific requirements may apply on which particle of the sample of, uh, sample have to be evaluated. This means, uh, do you have to regard agglomerates and aggregates in a specific way, for example? Um, in some cases, it might even not be possible to get a reliable sample distribution for the needed purpose and with and uh, the selected method. Okay, next slide. Within the TG125, um, we have uh, seven sections about uh, uh, measurement methods and um, uh, for the particles. And uh, each, sec uh, is, each section is divided uh, into some subsections, uh, uh, starting with the measurement principle, applicability, prerequisites, important influencing factors, the implementation of the measurement and data evaluation, and last but not least, information to be reported. This is uh, uh, contained in chapter nine, not in the particles section then. Okay, next slide, please. Now I will uh, roughly go through the methods and uh, explain something, uh, some details about the, or some uh, things about the methods. Okay, next slide. Yeah, starting with uh, the microscopic methods here. Uh, so uh, this is to say in this case for with the electron microscopy, 
um, with electron microscopy, you measure the equivalent circular diameter. Um, this means you have um, a, a circle and uh, determine the, the area within the circle. And this area has to be the same as for a particle, uh, which has a D, uh, 2D projection in the electron microscopy. The size distribution is a number based and uh, you measure in normal cases, the core particle. In some cases uh, where the material is suitable, uh, you can also measure the particle shell and the stabilization layer, or you can might get it out of the grayscale calculations. Electron microscopy has an advantage that it also delivers the shape and the ferret diameters, which means uh, that you can get the uh, uh, most extended and the smallest size of the particle. Okay, next slide. Scope and limit uh, of electron microscopy. Um, the size range is from one to thousand nanometers, uh, which is the scope of the of the uh, of the test guideline, and uh, you can measure all inorganic uh, particles, also some organic particles, if you prepare them correctly, for example, with sputtering. Um, you measure on a substrate and uh, take usually some days. The measurement itself uh, takes uh, not that time, but normally you need um, um, some time to get a, a measurement slot. And um, contamination has a low influence here. Only if you go to low uh, to elements with a low uh, set number, then uh, this, this might influence uh, the measurement. Um, you measure in vacuum, and this might also change the material. Next slide. Um, with this electron microscopy, we typically get something around 1,000 particles. Uh, you can extend it to this, but this will, is very time consuming. We can, this is one, the only method, method with, which really can distinguish between individual particles and agglomerates and aggregates. But still, this is limited to the sample and the sample preparation, of course. Electron microscopy can deliver a size resolution uh, about uh, one nanometer, below one nanometer, uh, and can even uh, get better for, to a really good uh, resolution uh, depending on the instrument. It can be used for mixtures of particles because you can uh, differentiate uh, geometry of the particles and also get some information from the grayscale and from the, uh, uh, from the EDX measurements. The EDX is also very suitable uh, for the particles. Uh, if particles consist of several substances, so you can get the content of the particles. Next slide, please. Um, for electron microscopy, we have the special situation um, that the counting of particles uh, plays, in plays a role, but it not, is not part of the TG125. This is, the reason for this is that different regulation uh, might apply and uh, we cannot catch every regulation within the TG125. So there's, there's, there's a, um, there is a publication uh, we, which we published uh, and um, there are four counting rules defined, um, which we uh, collected uh, all over the world. And um, these four rules um, define mainly how you can count particles. The first way is that you can only count individual particles and exclude agglomerates and aggregates. The second one is that you count, also count the agglomerates and aggregates um, as individual particles. Or you can count in the third way uh, also the particles within agglomerates. Um, and in the fourth way, you can also count the particles in agglomerates and aggregates. OK, next slide, please. Um, next measure uh, microscopic method is atomic force microscopy. And here you have um, um, you measure the height of particles above a substrate. Um, so you get a number-based distribution as for electron microscopy, and you get the complete particle. This includes shell and salvation layers, and also functionalization layers. This means you measure the outer diameter of the particle, which is in accordance with the definition of nanoparticle in ISO or also in the TG125. Next slide, please. 
again, we have the complete size range here. Um, we can also use uh, the method for all chemical compositions, um, but uh, except of chemicals which react with the tap. We have again a substrate. Again, we have, uh, the measurement takes some days and the contamination uh, in this case has to be very low because we can not differentiate between the substances. Vacuum is possible for this measurement method uh, and my, then again, we might, uh, this vacuum might change the material. Next slide. We get, uh, again, we get uh, 1000 particles for the statistics, something like this, depending on the measurement time again. Um, in some cases, we can uh, distinguish between individual particles and agglomerates aggregates, uh, but this, this is not the normal case. We can, uh, AFN can in some cases deliver a good size resolution depending on the instrument resolution itself and on the tap and material. Um, we cannot differentiate between mixed shots of particles uh, only in some special cases. And uh, for particles consisting of several uh, substances, uh, this doesn't play a role here. We can. This is independent of the substance. Next slide, please. Now we come to the methods, methods for particles in liquids. These are three ones. The first one is the centrifugal liquid, liquid sedimentation. Uh, as the uh, uh, name says, uh, we have a centrifuge and a particle is introduced in the liquid and uh, uh, travels through the liquid, depending on the viscosity of the liquid, the density of the liquid, and the density of the particle. And uh, this is described by the Stokes, uh, Stokes equation. And uh, from this, we get a Stokes uh, equivalent spherical diameter. So this is based, uh, this is of course uh, volume based since we have uh, intensity, uh, volume or intensity based. Uh, it depends on the exact uh, uh, system you have. Uh, this is not only one system, this, uh, this is, is, is a bench of systems with different detection uh, units here. Um, so you measure the complete particle. Uh, this means you include shell and stabilization layers. You include the functionalization layers and uh, also uh, the solvation layers here. Um, this is uh, true for all the um, measurement methods in liquids. Uh, I don't repeat it on the other slides. Next slide. You have the size range from 10 nanometers to 10,000 nanometers. This depends on the density of the particles. Uh, might be smaller than. Uh, you can measure all chemical compositions. Uh, the density needs to be known. You measure, of course, a liquid. Uh, the prepared sample has to be stable until the measurement. Um, not during the measurement, until the measurement. And the contamination um, with larger particles should be avoided. The particle concentration in the sample should not exceed 0.2 volume percent. Next slide. This is the first method where you uh, have a good, really good size uh, statistic information because uh, um, you measure above 100,000 particles, might be a million. Um, and uh, distinguishing between individual particles and agglomerates aggregates is in only possible if you have prior knowledge. Um, for example, you know you have a very narrow size distribution here. Um, the method can deliver a good resolution for the particle size distribution. This again, of course, depends always on the manufacturer. And um, it, in some cases, it might be possible to, get, to uh, characterize mixtures of different particles. What's not possible um, is that to uh, detect particles consisting of several substances, except if you know all partial densities included in this particle. Okay, next slide. The second method uh, um, in liquids is uh, dynamic light scattering. Most of you will know this method. Uh, you irradiate um, a sample by uh, laser, uh, uh, by a laser beam, and uh, detect the scattered light. Uh, the particles move due to the burning motion, and um, you get a hydrodynamic mobility di diameter out of this. And since it's a scattered light, you, it's of course intensity based. And you again, you measure the complete particle, including the observation layer. Next slide. The size range is uh, the <clears throat> is the whole scope of the TG and depends again on the density of the particle. You can measure all chemical compositions and liquids, and the stability of the prepared sample is uh, 
needs uh, to be at least 20 minutes. Um, the quanta uh, contamination with larger particles should be avoided and the particle concentration in the sample uh, should be below 0.2 volume percent. Next slide. Again, we have uh, good statistical information. Uh, the other capabilities um, are not so good for DLS because uh, we cannot really separate the particles if, uh, as far as we need them. Next slide. Nanoparticle tracking analysis is um, it's based on the same principle with the, uh, as DLS, but we don't measure the ensemble of particles, we measure the single particles here. And uh, we can view them through a microscope or something like this, and uh, then you can uh, see them moving uh, again. They move in accordance to the Brownian motion and uh, deliver a hydrodynamic mobility uh, part uh, diameter. And, uh, but in contrast to DLS, we, we get a number-based uh, uh, size distribution here. And again, we measure the complete particle. Next slide. Um, size range is again 10 nanometer to 10,000 nanometer, depending on the density. Again, this will might limit the size range. We can measure all chemical compositions, uh, matrix materials, again, liquids, uh, the measurement time is uh, in contrast to DLS and CLS uh, some hours because we have to count the particles and the contamination has a low dependency here, um, except if the contamination is in the same size range as the particles. Particle concentration in the sample needs to be something like 10 to 6 to, uh, to 10 to 9 particles per milliliter. Next slide. We, the PTA again counts the particles, so we get something around 1,000 particles. Of course, we can extend this with time, uh, but uh, then we have to take care that the sample is stable. Um, it cannot differentiate between individual particles and agglomerates aggregates. It might deliver a good size distribution depending on the density of the particle. Um, it might differentiate between mixtures of particles if the size ratio is bigger than 1 to 1.25. And uh, it uh, might uh, detect particles consisting of several substances. Again, if all partial densities were included in a particle are known. Next slide. So <clears throat> I, we have two additional uh, methods. Um, next slide. One is the differential mobility analysis system. Um, this is the only method measuring in air. So you introduce particles from a liquid into the air. Um, the airflow is going through an electrical field and the electrical field will attract the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, influence the particles and, uh, and separate them uh, in accordance to the size. So we get a number based size distribution um, based on the electromobility of the particle. You measure the complete particle, you include uh, shell and stabilization layers, you include functionalization layers in a dry status. Um, again, as for, set for, uh, for AFM, you also get the outer diameter here uh, in accordance with ISO and OCD TG 125. Next slide. <clears throat> <clears throat> size range is two nanometers to 1,000 nanometers. Chemical composition is uh, is all chemical uh, all particles, uh, as long as you take care that uh, that the operator is not contaminated from the particles, and uh, the matrix material is of course air. Uh, normal measurement takes 20 minutes, and the contamination of the initial um, suspension has to be very very low. Each cont uh, contamination uh, will be visible uh, later on in the air, uh, will, will uh, form uh, ghost particles in the air and will be visible in the spectrum of the, uh, of the size. Okay, next slide. You get a good uh, statistic information out of this method. Uh, you can, in special case cases, uh, distinguish uh, between individual particles and agglomerates aggregates if you have prior knowledge and then size distribution is very narrow. Um, the method can deliver a good resolution for the particle size distribution. And uh, since it's is independent of the substance, you can also measure mix, mixtures of particles and particles co uh, containing several substances. 
Next slide. Last method is a, a small angular X-ray scattering. Uh, you irradiate a, a, a sample with uh, uh, X-ray radiation and the scattered X-ray uh, will then be detected by a detector. You see this blue and yellow image, which is, uh, is uh, typical for, 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 uh, for ZAX. And uh, you see the intensity of the scattered light and uh, this can be transferred to a, to a graph and uh, then you can get the size of the particles out of this presentation. Of course, you have the intensity of the scattered light as index here and uh, as always with scattered light, uh, it's uh, dependent on the volume of the particle. The um, measured diameter is a core particle. In some cases, it's possible to measure shell or stabilization layer um, if the electron density contrast of the layer is good enough. Um, if you know size and shape of the particles, you can also get some information about the agglomeration state uh, in some cases. Okay, next slide. The size range is one to 200 nanometers. Uh, actually, might be extended in future. Chemical uh, composition uh, could be measured. Uh, everything, I think, uh, as long as the contrast of the electron density, the matrix material needs is high enough. Uh, for sex, the matrix material is very interesting because you can measure nearly everything in liquid or as solid. Uh, you, you can measure it here. The stability of the prepared sample uh, needs to have hours, uh, which is normal measurement time and um, contamination has a low influence here. Interesting is that the required prior knowledge uh, is that you need the shape and you need the packing of the particles. If you don't have this, uh, Zax works with an assumption of spherical particles and separated particles, uh, which in most cases fits, but might be in some cases wrong. Next slide. SACS delivers uh, good statistical information uh, and can distinguish between individual particles and agglomerates aggregates. Uh, in some cases, the scattering theory includes this possibility and it has been demonstrated for some cases. I'm careful with this <laughs> and uh, can deliver a very good size resolution. Um, it can, in some cases, be used for mixtures of particles uh, of different sizes, and it can be used for it can be used for particles consisting of several substances only if the if you have the complete knowledge about the composition of the particles. Next slide. Finally, I want to say some words about the interlaboratory compassion and some final remarks. Next slide. We started the interlaboratory comparison by selecting seven uh, materials, which are listed here. And uh, we selected the materials in accordance to the properties we wanted to address. For example, we wanted to address core shell particles and we tried to have uh, at least two materials for each property. And uh, we, we managed to do this for each property we wanted to address, except of solubility, okay, uh, this will be addressed in another test guideline then. Next slide. Um, we sent out the materials and got back uh, the results for uh, several methods and for several uh, materials. In final, we got back 250 resu uh, single results. Um, and um, these results uh, were then collected, analyzed, and we calculated uh, the standard deviation for each combination of, uh, of material and, uh, and method. Next slide. We then uh, got a standard, uh, got uh, something like this here. This is an example for polystyrene mixture of 90 and 125 nanometer, where we have in the table um, the diameters included uh, with, the, with the standard deviation for each method if it, for each uh, uh, method and diameter. And you see already that the standard deviation is not uh, so uh, so high. It's, it's very low. Uh, it's not exceeding 50% or something like this. Um, for this particles, the standard deviation is really good here. Uh, we had other examples where, where the standard deviation exceeded 50% and then we had to exclude 
uh, this measurement from uh, from the uh, evaluation. Fifty percent uh, of of the size was was the limit here. If you uh, have a look at the highlighted um, uh, results here, then you see that the results are in very very good agreement with each other. And uh, this is something we did not expect for, for this mixture uh, of particles. Um, also, the other results listed here uh, are in, in a good, a good agreement uh, with these uh, uh, highlighted results. Um, in, the right, in the left side, you see um, uh, the, the, the graph for this. And uh, you see uh, in the upper, the blue ones are the mean diameter. Uh, the red ones are the median diameter, and the black ones are the modal values for the two diameters. Next slide. So, what are the main results from the interlaboratory comparison? Um, some were expected, like that ideal spherical particles can be characterized by several methods with reliable results was expected, and also expected was that real materials can be well characterized if a basic homogeneity and stability is ensured. Um, inhomogenic and agglomerated particles deliver significant different results for different methods. This was also partly expected, um, but lead us uh, to the um, to, to the sentence that we need at least two independent methods here. Um, particles with, with small differences in size can be well characterized with most methods. We have seen this on the last slide. And particles with big differences in size can often lead to an underestimation of the smaller particles because they are hidden somewhere. Um, a little bit surprising, but uh, also not so surprising, um, full automated detection of particles for electron images is still prone to errors. We got some results from full automated detection, and most of them were not within the limits, and can therefore uh, this can therefore actually not rec be recommended. This might change in future. Next slide. So the main, uh, the OEG, the test guideline 125 now includes some additional features compared to the test guideline 110, where it is based on. Um, we have seen that all methods have their advantages, advantages and disadvantages. Uh, so. Um, the OECD test guide 125 therefore strongly suggests to characterize materials with at least two independent methods. Independent is important here. So you can choose one image-based method and one with good statistics. We have seen that the index system has been introduced uh, where different diameters will be noted with different symbols. And this is to avoid misinterpretation of diameters in the future. And uh, it's also a very basic need for the for reliable data exchange. If a certain diameter is needed, like hydrodynamic or aerodynamic, the most suitable method has to be chosen. A recalculation of one diameter into another diameter is always biased and cannot at all be recommended. What we didn't mention till now is that the reporting of the results was harmonized and is given in the OECD test guide 25 in chapter nine with mandatory reporting details as far as they apply for the purpose. Okay, next slide. With this, uh, I want to close the part of particles and uh, invite uh, to a workshop. Next slide. Um, so unfortunately, the workshop is only in German, but we have some German participants here. So uh, the workshop will be next week on the 16th and 17th of February. Uh, it's only about the particle part and it will contain ex extended info and uh, contact points for each of the methods we described here already. Um, and uh, the registration link is shown in the bottom of the page and um, maybe also in the chat. Okay, and with this, I close the particles part and hand over to Thomas, who will now talk about the uh, fiber part, uh, which is a little bit more uh, technical, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot, Harald, for your presentation and on the particles and all the different methods. And yes, this section uh, is on fibers and is somewhat different, as you already said. So, Harald, 
since uh, you had several methods within the fiber section, we only deal with one or two methods, which is electron microscopy, the scanning electron microscopy and the transmission electron microscopy. And therefore we have a little bit more time to go into the validation. Next slide, please. So uh, looking into the uh, scope of fiber size distribution, the point I would like to address here is that this TG test guideline is somewhat different to what we have in other test guidelines and what we had before. It's that we uh, actually request the pairwise uh, determination of the diameter and length of the individual fibers. Um, which then allows, for example, for the detection of uh, two different types of uh, fibers that you have a short, thick and a thin, long fiber that these uh, can be differentiated, which otherwise is not possible. So such pairwise determination is therefore of higher relevance for reliable determination of fiber related risks in toxicological, but also in epidemiological studies and hence also recommended for the um, physical uh, description of the fibers being produced or being handled. Uh, next slide, please. So the structure here is not very much different to what you have experienced before. Uh, the measurement methods were introduced as said by the particle and there we had the same approach for electron microscopy being used in fibers. We introduce the measurement principle and the methodological approach. We have a closer look into the applicability, look into prerequisites and important influencing factors, um, uh, then uh, go into the details of the actual implementation of the measurements and later on into the data evaluation and uncertainty evaluation. Next slide, please. So what did we actually looked at when we went and did the validation for the particle size distribution for the fibers? As you can see here, we looked for metallic oxides, but also for carbon-based uh, fibers and rods. On the upper left to, uh, corner, you see the uh, gold rods, nano rods. Then on the top right, uh, the silver fiber, um, the, the silver silver fibers. Zinc oxide fibers are in the lower left end, multi-walled carbon nanotubes and some electrons micro microscopic pictures in the middle. And at the lower right end, you see the silica carbide fibers as they were determined. And uh, with the next slide, uh, you see that uh, all of these fibers of these materials were analyzed for SEM and TEM. The sample preparation uh, was done uh, that the deposition for multi walled carbon nanotube, it was deposited on gold co uh, coated polycarbonate filter so that the multi walled carbon nanotube had enough contrast. And all other uh, materials were deposited on silicon wafers and TEM grits so um, that they could be analyzed. Then all partners for the interlaboratory comparison were ask A, that they do an electronic micro, a microscopic analysis according to, at that time, a draft test guideline, and uh, that they should determine more than 200 fibers, pairwise the diameter and length. And secondly, that uh, they determine more than 200 fibers or measure 200 fibers, pairwise diameter and length from a given picture, which is uh, was a picture, uh, yeah, electron microscopy, uh, microscopy picture of silver, and the results will be presented. Um, what we also did that we had for the fibers and used fiber detects and image J, uh, com a comparison of manual and software uh, based determination. And overall, there were 13 institutes participating in this comparison for fibers only uh, worldwide and sending in uh, 56 results. And as Katrin Schwierin already mentioned in her introduction, uh, also a big thanks from our side, from the fibers, but also from the particles to all these institutes um, participating in these uh, interlaboratory comparison for the OECD. Next slide, please. The data evaluation was done as you can expect it. There were statistical tests that we can see that uh, the results were plausible. 
the T test, Wilcox on signed rank test, fix uh, effect models, and there were others. Please do not ask me in detail for all the different tests. A statistician was doing those. And as was done with all uh, other interlaboratory comparison, the results of the statistical analysis and the results of the um, conducted measurement were discussed between all the participants of the interlaboratory comparison. And the final evaluation was uh, done unisono between all participants of uh, this uh, validation procedure, as also reported in uh, the validation report. Uh, one problem, and as you will see later on, uh, the was with the silver fibers. Um, we later noticed that the 10 grids were contaminated with sulfur, at least for silver. And as you can see on the right-hand side, one of these electron microscopic pictures, you see some black and some um, brighter parts along the fibers. So that was the sulfurized uh, silver. So therefore, the measurement with TEM for silver had to be excluded from this interlaboratory comparison. Next slide, please. Um, as a first visual test, what did we do? And here, um, as I mentioned before, we have the silver fibers we take here as an example. And uh, here we see the pictures being taken by the different laboratories indicated by the SEM1 to SEM15. And you see on the left-hand side, the diameter on the x-axis and uh, the percentage of the counted fibers uh, with these diameters on the y-axis, which is called then the cumulative size distribution. On the left-hand side, indicated the diameter. On the right-hand side, you see the length of the fibers. Please uh, note that the x-axis for the length is times 10 to the 3 which means it is in the order of one micrometer. Um, but please have a look at the diameter. One of the uh, issues which we dealt with and had a look at um, when we uh, looked at the diameters were the dependence of the determined diameters on the re resolution being used by the electron microscope. You see numbers uh, next to each of the lines with the different colors going from the left, uh, I think 3.72, up to the largest value to uh, 9.92, with one exception, which is at the green line, with the uh, which has the resolution of 3.54. This green line with the diameter had to be excluded, and uh, the uh, cumulative curve here was different from the others, not due to the resolution of the pixel, but it was due to that uh, the picture was not taken very sharply. Um, so um, therefore this analysis had to be excluded. Otherwise, the results as shown here, you see that the uh, slope or the steepest slope on the left hand side has the highest resolution, 3.72 nanometer per pixel, while uh, the curve on the right hand side had a resolution of 5.58 nanometers per pixel. So we do see a small significant issue that the uh, resolution of the uh, picture being taken by the electron microscopy may play a role and therefore a strong recommendation or a clear indication within the test guideline on the resolution is given so that this result become only minor influenced by the extra, extra resolution because we always say um, that it is at least three or four pixel per diameter, which we need to determine that correctly. Um, so this as a first indication to see how comparable are all these results. Then um, in summary, next slide, please. We have a look here and you see the diameter on the X axis being shown and on the Y axis of the lengths of the uh, particles or of the fibers being determined by SEM and TEM. And uh, what you also see, uh, the, the SEMs are represented by the dots and the different colors for the different elements or for the different types of uh, elemental uh, composition of the fibers and the crosses are used for the TEM uh, analysis results. The bars indicate uh, the arrow bars in uh, the form of uh, two standard deviation. 
um, on along the uh, x-axis for the diameter, along the y-axis for the length. Um, what we can see here that uh, on the one hand, we do don't have any uh, TEM analysis for the multi ward carbon nanotubes, which um, was due to the sampling process um, that the fibers were for TEM and on the grids were not always flat on the surface, but they were erroneously partially showing up um, from the surface so that the length and diameter determination was erroneous just due to the way they were deposited on the uh, on the grid so that was one of the problems and why it was not possible to analyze them on a tem grid and no tem analysis was available and secondly you see for i think it was a silicon uh, carbide and uh, the green one silicon carbide you only see one of the crosses because one of the other laboratories which we had or the other laboratories had erroneous results uh, being determined there as well so um but overall this is how the picture is between uh, comparability so you can have a look here between tem and sem as well as the uncertainties but to make the results a little bit easier to understand, next slide, please. The results are summarized uh, in this kind of table where you see in the upper line, the silver, uh, uh, the gold, silver, multi-ward carbon, nano, uh, multi carbon nanotubes, zinc oxide and silica carbide. And for the different method, SEM and TEM, the mean diameters with a two times standard deviation, or median diameter, mean length, and median diameter. And the cask scheme shows that those which are in green, the relative uncertainty determined by the uh, standard deviation, two times standard deviation, less than 35%. Yellow, the difference is less than 50%. And orange, or the case when there was a, a deviation larger than 50%. And uh, this is uh, the results. So you see that most of the results are better than 35%. You see, as I indicated, for multi ward carbon nanotubes, no TEM results. And for silicon carbide, only one SEM results. And unluckily for silver with the sulfurization, also the problem that we had no results there for TEM. So that was the databases with uh, which we were using. Next slide, please. We also had a look and uh, we're using the set of silver fiber pictures to analyze for the difference between whether uh, what is the contribution by the manual analysis um, alone or which uh, is the uncertainty when we have the manual analysis including all the other steps of sample preparation and interlaboratory comparison as indicated here. So uh, if we have a look as for example shown up for the median and mean for the round, uh, round robin, we see that the median diameters for the same image or mean diameters for the same images do have only an uncertainty um, of around 11% if we take the two sigma, which is the plus minus 54, while if we have the full interlaboratory comparison so that all the different steps were done in the other laboratory, this uncertainty increases uh, here for the silver to 30, 29, 32%, as indicated on the right uh, side of the table at the lower end of this slide. So um, this type of information clearly indicates, yes, there is a contribution of the man, uh, manual analysis to the total, but the variance is much bigger when we have the all steps being in an interlaboratory comparison. So the analyzer, him or herself, um, even they were trained, but not extremely well trained. So, and they were coming from, from all over uh, the different 13 laboratories. We do see, yes, there is a significant contribution, but um, a lot of difference variance also comes in uh, by the other steps of the analysis. Um, coming to the next slide, please. So uh, coming to the features and main results we obtained for this test guideline for fibers. So uh, large deviation, we saw them between SEM and TM, especially for long fibers. 
So, uh, and having a detailed look into our analysis and the validation data we had at hand, within this test guideline, we limit the replicability for TEM to short fibers to less than five micrometers at this point of time. Um, so that uh, if we want to determine longer fibers, SEM is recommended. We do see no large dependency between pixel size resolution and fiber diameters for SEM. Uh, we have shown you the example in the slides. The dependency seems to be slightly uh, larger for the uh, TEM, um, but that was the result as we obtained, but still it can be normally used. The influence of the manual picture analysis uh, compared to the total variance was determined to be small. And I think the most important result for uh, this um, test guideline is, yes, nanofiber can be determined pairwise by TEM and SEM, and that we can really use them for uh, to, to get detailed information on fiber mixtures, on fiber, fibers being produced by different mechanisms, maybe if we have different types of samples. So next slide, please. Next slide is um, I introduced to you um, a slightly different, as you noticed, more details on the validation, which was possible here for the fibers, or details on the validation process, including the materials and uh, what was done as, as SOPs for preparing the samples, can be found in the validation report on particle and fiber size distribution measurements of nanomaterials, which is easily available on the OECD websites. Next slide, please. So with this, um, I'm, I hope that uh, these presentations were all helpful for you, that you had a good view into what the test guideline 125 is for, the scope and what are the limitations, what can it do and where it can be of help and where it can be applied to. And uh, I pass back, I think, to Ma for the question and answer session section. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, uh, Thomas and, and all the speakers. So perhaps if I can just invite you, uh, Catherine, Harold, uh, well, Thomas, you're there, and uh, Doris, please, just to, to put your cameras on so we can see you and have a little bit more um, visibility here, yeah. Okay, so just uh, to remind you, we have been sharing links uh, in the chat, lots of them. Uh, we, you have also been posting questions via the Q&A uh, question box. Some of them have already been answered, so we invite you uh, to check if uh, the answer that you have posted has been uh, answered. And otherwise, we will try to see the, the remaining questions that we have there. So I wonder if uh, my speakers can see them in their screen, some of them. So we have, for example, are there guidelines for highly poly dispersed samples, uh, including, okay, hold on. So we're having more questions popping up. So if you can all just check, on the Q&A questions to see whether your question has been addressed or if you have something else. And in the meantime, if I can ask my speakers uh, just to check if there is a specific uh, questions that you can address uh, from the remaining ones. I, I see that you have already been typing some answers there. So everybody's reading. <laughs> I, I may go to the question of Yu Yang Sang, um, which was on nanocellulose and fibers for the for the very long one. Um, so, I think if you look into the validation report, you see the various types of fibers which were used, and um, this is where we recommend these materials for the testing. Yeah. And if you use a fiber which comes along the size range you were um, you are expecting or you want to analyze, 
We try to have a large variability up to 20 micrometer in length and diameters also ranging over 100 to uh, uh, about 10 nanometers or less. So uh, you will find within these uh, a good um, indication which validation material or testing material you may use for the type you want to analyze. Thank you for providing an answer, Thomas. So from my other speakers, are there any other thing that you wish to add to these questions to, or to one of the remaining ones? Some might not be direct directly to the 125, so it might be difficult uh, for you to, to answer. But uh, just to remind you that uh, we have uh, around 150 test guidelines uh, in the OECD website, not all of them obviously are uh, uh, focused or applicable to nanomaterials. This is why uh, we have been uh, developing this, this new test guideline, like uh, it was presented today, 110 uh, was, uh, is, is for uh, regular chemicals. And, and today we have heard about 125, which is more focused on nanomaterials. So, we really invite you to, to check the website and to see whether there are other uh, test guidelines that may, might be of interest to you. And just to contact the secretariat if there are specific uh, information that you need for those. So we can relate those to the, to the authors. Okay. Uh, Catherine Thomas, uh, I don't see uh, other questions popping up. Is there... Uh, oh, yes, we have a comment in the chat. There is a, a document, a guidance on sample preparation and the symmetry for nanomaterials that was developed and updated, uh, if, I, if I recall correctly, in 2012. Uh, this uh, guidance <coughs> document is currently being updated to accommodate uh, the most uh, updated information uh, developed in and included in some of the test guidelines uh, that have been published and uh, and and the current state of science so we expect to have this uh, guidance document available in 2024 probably you, you will you will be able to see some draft in the website uh, later this year so so for your question uh, Pierre, for Pierre Francesco Maybe I can answer the question from Peter Bro uh, Benson. Please go ahead. Yeah, and um, any experience with iron oxide and nano um, measurements? Um, we currently developing some iron oxide nanomaterials, reference materials here in at BAM, and we are characterizing them at the moment. So. Um, I would advise questions for, uh, for iron oxide particles uh, directly to me in, uh, pass, uh, after the session, I think. Thank you, Harald. And uh, yes, if you have questions, I will put my email uh, also on the chat. If you have uh, very specific questions or you wish to, to get in touch with one of our speakers today, you should feel free to, to contact me and I will be happy to, to put you in touch. Thomas, Catherine, Doris, anything that you wish to add for today? Or uh, I think we're coming to, to the end of this uh, webinar and I think uh, you have been answering questions as, uh, as they have been posted. So all this is going to be captured and made available as part of the, the webinar proceedings. Is there anything that you wish to add? Just a um, small... Just... <laughs> you first, Catherine. Sorry. Just that there are... Uh, for the at the moment there are coming so many questions in so it's difficult to follow them because uh, one will be skipped away by the next question so maybe there is a possibility to answer questions afterwards and, and send it to the people who ask these questions. Yes, I mean, we, we're going to be uh, keeping the questions and then what we can do is uh, for some of them, if you, if you wish, we can uh, we can prepare them in writing and include them in the proceedings of the, and recording of this webinar. So that's not a that's not a problem. Mm -hmm. It was 
going a similar line for Katrin. The questions are sometimes uh, special and detailed uh, and answers are possible. But um, so many, I think uh, it's best if we use, choose the way as you were describing, Mark. Yeah. So, so just uh, please send them to us. I mean, we are capturing everything that you have been submitting through the webinar. And, uh, and we will be answering them and including them in the, with the recording of this, uh, of this webinar. And I think with that, uh, I just want to thank you all for attending this webinar. I want to thank uh, Catherine, Thomas, Harald and Doris because they have been uh, the force behind this document for several years now. And, and now they have accepted to, to share with us uh, their experience, their uh, their knowledge uh, in, in preparing these test guidelines. And uh, we're very happy that, uh, that we have so many of you joining, uh, joining this webinar. Please uh, check our website, OECD Nanomet. You can also sign up on the newsletter as, as we, uh, you can just see the links in the screen, but you will all receive uh, an email after the webinar and it we will inform you when the recording are made available. And I, and just to finalize, I really want to, to thank our interpreters to make it possible for us to reach out to, to our Latin American and the Spanish speaking uh, colleagues uh, to make this uh, work accessible to them. So thank you so much. And uh, we hope to see you at our next uh, webinar.